Welcome, everybody. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Mira Debs, and I'm the director of Yelp's Education Studies Program. And I'm talking to you this evening from Hamden, Connecticut, which is on um, Pripyat, Wappager, and Pagasset land. Um, and um, this evening's webinar comes from many conversations with Yale students who are looking to go into teaching after graduation. With an ever increasing number of avenues of ways to go into teaching, it can often be hard to figure out how to navigate that. Um, so um, our goal this evening is to lay out a range of different options and let you hear from Yale alumni who've followed a variety of different paths um, of going into teaching. And um, we are going to be um, first talking about um, an overview of pathways into teaching. Um, and I'll be talking about that with my um, education studies colleague, Melissa Sheedy. And then following that, we'll have a teacher panel with um, Edie Abraham Mott um, and teachers Israel Tovar, Nana Massey, Constance Sarche Collins, and Alyssa Levy. And then after that, we're going to have time for question and answer with the panelists. Um, so um, let me talk first about um, our pathways into teaching. Um, so for myself, um, I uh, come into the role of being um, the executive director of Ed Studies at Yale um, from a background um, teaching high school history. I did my teacher training at Oxford University um, in England, um, and I'm happy to talk if anyone has questions about the challenges of translating a British teacher certification back to the United States to Massachusetts, which actually turned out to be harder than I thought it would be. Um, and I got my first teaching job teaching at um, Acton Boxborough in the suburbs of Boston, and then um, shifted to teach in a charter school um, in the city of Boston. Um, so let me turn things over to Melissa. Hi everyone, it's nice to see you tonight. Uh, my name is Melissa Sheevy. I teach a class in education studies on the principles of effective classroom teaching, and I hope some of you will consider taking it next spring. Uh, before coming to Yale, I was at Stanford for eight years and worked in the Stanford teacher education program. And before that, I was a high school teacher for about 20 years in um, four different high schools. I did uh, rural, uh, suburban, private, and also uh, charter. And I'm really happy to talk to you tonight about a pathways into teaching that you can consider. Um, and I'm sorry about the, the dings going on right now. I think for next time, I'll know that I need to put those on silence. Um, and I'll see if when I switch over to Edie, if I can, if I can take those off. Um, so this one of the things we want to talk about at the beginning is um, why become a teacher and how what does the process look like for doing it after you do um, an undergrad degree at Yale or some other place um, where you're not necessarily doing the teacher a teacher prep program as an undergrad. Um, I often hear from Yale students, well maybe I'll do teaching but then I want to go on and do something um, like policy that's going to have a bigger impact. Um, and I can see you know people people um, are often um, excited about the idea that they're doing something that is making big changes in the world, or maybe that's a way of um, making their families think that you're doing something really important. Um, but one way that I tell students to think about it is um, the, the kind of um, incredible micro impact at the grassroots that you have from being a teacher, um, and the kind of cumulative impact that you have on a community of the number of students that you work with over time. Um, I also think that um, it's just incredibly powerful work to be a teacher from my own experience um, of just every day I knew that um, I was doing something that was important and I wasn't um, doubting uh, the significance of the work that I was doing. Um, another way that I talk with students about um, thinking about what your priorities are as your um, thinking about what kind of job you want to do after graduation is thinking on a number of different scales. Um, so we often tend to think of the, um, the, the category of compensation or the recognition of, and status that comes with a position. Um, and often for those reasons, um, students will say, well, I'm not sure that I want to be a teacher because it doesn't pay enough or it's not valued enough by society. Um, but I think teaching um, 
is really beneficial um, when you're thinking about um, it giving you flexibility to live in a lot of different places. And you'll hear that from the panelists this evening um, uh, of the opportunity to um, work with a really committed group of people who, um, who care about um, raising the next generation of young people and doing good in the world. Um, it can be a very stable profession. Um, and it's something where I think uh, teachers generally have a lot of autonomy in the classroom um, and, and also a sense of meaning and purpose in the work that they do. Melissa, do you want to add anything else to, to, to what I mentioned? I would just say there's no greater pr privilege than having the opportunity to engage with young people who will be the future of our world. So it's, it's just an incredibly wonderful honor to get to hear everything they have to say every day and get to be witness to their, to how they engage with their lives. Um, some other factors to consider on a practical, practical level. Um, one is that your major actually matters for teaching because um, when you um, are either doing a teacher prep program or doing alternative certification, that's not a time that you're learning the content of what you're going to teach. You're going to be learning how to teach, but um, programs or schools are going to expect you to get a particular amount of co content knowledge in undergrad for, for most middle high school teaching. There's some flexibility about that if you do some kind of humanities major you can teach in other humanities if you do social science you may be able to teach history um, but it's hard if you were an english major to suddenly shift to being a math teacher um, so think about your major um, think about where you want to end up because often um, going into teaching has very localized networks um, and certification is a state-by-state -state process so like i mentioned it was hard to go from being certified to teach in england to going back to massachusetts um, you can attend a super prestigious university on one side of the country, and it can be quite hard to transfer um, to an, a, another part of, um, of the country as well. Um, so oftentimes attending a state school in the community that you want to end up teaching um, is just fine and actually um, much, much cheaper than um, a fancy Ivy League uh, teacher prep degree. Another way of thinking about how you want to go into teaching is, are you thinking about this as a long term um, goal or are you thinking about this as something that you want to do for a short period of time? Um, I think ideally our profession needs people for the long term, but um, there's also ways that you can make a significant contribution for a short period of time. And we'll talk about that as we go over options. And then finally, I would think about what population of students do you want to teach? Um, that will impact what kinds of schools you're looking at. What is your organization's track record in doing this kind of work? Um, it's good to read uh, online to see if you can find critical comments as well as positive comments. Um, and how will this particular organization help train you to do the work with care? Um, specifically, um, I'm thinking about if you're a white teacher who's working um, with population of students from a different ethnic or racial background. Um, so what kind of training do you have um, for being thoughtful about entering into that space? Um, so this evening, Melissa and I are going to talk really briefly about um, four different avenues for going into teaching. Um, a master's teacher prep program, alternative certification programs, um, private school, and international teaching fellowships. Um, for the master's teacher prep program, um, this uh, kind of option um, varies from um, prestigious universities that charge $60,000, $70,000 a year for tuition uh, to your local state school. Um, but usually with all these programs, you're university based and you're a full time student and the programs go from one to two years. Um, so a big, a big factor of this is the tuition cost up front of paying. Um, but oftentimes there's federal, state and local grants available and some universities even have their own funding available. Um, and in the past, it used to be that um, when you did a teacher prep program, you were basically a full time student for a while. You did a lot of um, courses in education theory um, or child development. And then at the very end, you did your student teaching. But a lot of programs have now switched to having an embedded residency. So you are um, taking coursework, but you're and you're also working in schools from the start. But importantly and differently from some of the other avenues, you are not the teacher in charge of the classroom, which is called being the teacher of record. Um, some of the benefits of doing a teacher, um, teacher prep masters before you become a full-time teacher. Um, one is that teaching is, um, 
is something that takes time to learn how to do well. Um, and it takes messing up, making mistakes, having mentors. Um, there's a lot of, uh, of knowledge in terms of working with students with special needs or English language learners. Um, and you are gradually getting to learn all of that as you practice being a teacher. Um, and research has also shown that um, teachers who do a master's uh, feel more prepared once they go in the classroom and they stay in the classroom longer. Um, so I think that it's a, kind of a more stable entry than getting thrown in at the deep end um, with some of the alternative um, prep programs. Um, I think the main drawback of doing a master's program is the tuition and living costs. Um, so that's certainly something that, that's worthwhile factoring, factoring in, um, but also, it's definitely important to look into what kind of aid is available because I think um, my my former students tell me that they're often surprised by how much aid they're able to find um, for doing that. So let me turn things over to Melissa um, to talk about alternative certification. Thanks, Mira. So I'm going to talk about three different alternative certifications pathways. First, I'm going to talk about the assistant teacher pathway that's usually um, embedded in a charter school. Next, I'm going to talk about city and state residency programs. And then finally, uh, teacher pipeline programs. There's probably other alternative pathways as well. And the use of the word alternative is that you, you did not go to a traditional university-based program like what Mira just talked about, That hence the word alternative. So I'm first going to talk about being an assistant teacher. So most of the large charter school networks, they're called, you know, CMOs, charter maintenance organizations, like you might have heard of um, KIPP, for example, the Knowledge is Power program is one large one across the country. Some that are nestled here in New England are like Uncommon or Achievement First. In the Midwest, you have like the Noble Network. And on the West Coast, you have like Aspire and Green Dot. Um, but most of these charter school networks now have um, assistant teacher pathways. So you're not the teacher of record, you're an assistant in someone else's classroom. So you get to kind of learn through the apprentice model. And while you're the uh, assistant teacher in the class, you're also concurrently taking courses. So you're full time as an assistant in the classroom. And then you're also full time trying to go to school uh, on the evenings and weekends in order to get uh, certified. So one of the benefits of this is you have a mentorship from an experienced teacher. You're learning both the theory and the practice, hopefully the theory from from your graduate degree classes and the practice from being in the classroom and it's usually typically subsidized the drawback is that the salary is really low uh usually somewhere between 20 and twenty five thousand dollars at uh you know not not really a, a, a true living wage and um you know you're also going to potentially be at a a school that maybe doesn't fit with your uh philosophy about uh, the human condition or about students you may have seen uh, recently and, and you surely have heard from Professor Debs's class about the no excuses charter school model, which has received uh, a lot of critique. Many of the charter school networks have, have moved away from that use of that language. Um, and I think you just have to interrogate whether or not their practices have moved away from that as well. Thanks, Mira. Can you move on to the next one? Um, so another option is to do an embedded city or state residency. So this is like if you know, oh, wow, I'm from New York City and I'd really like to be a, a teacher in the New York City public school system, then you could apply to be part of the New York City teacher's residency, for example. And you'll see some other examples there, Baltimore or Teach Kentucky. There's lots of them all over the country. These are usually associated with um, the public schools in those given city or states. Um, and you are the full time teacher of record after an intensive uh, summer boot camp. And so, you know, you might get six to eight weeks of training on the pedagogy, the professionalization of being a teacher. And then you are the teacher of record starting at the beginning of the school year. So that's a that's a pretty uh, quick initiation into teaching where you're taking the coursework while you are teaching. And some people might use the analogy, you're building the plane as you're flying it. Um, this is typically a two to five year commitment. It really varies um, from state to state. And usually the, the, the 
how you want to be, what area you want to be certified, it might just not be wide open. It might be, you know, we really have needs in these particular certification areas. And so therefore you have to apply in these. And that's often um, an L teacher, English language learner, or uh, special needs for neurodiverse learners, or potentially math or science or other places where uh, content areas where they really have difficulty filling all the positions. I would say one other benefit is you typically get to interview um, once you finish the summer program or while you're doing the summer program, you typically get to interview for different positions at different schools. So you, you have some choice in terms of uh, placement. Um, thank you, uh, Mira, if you want to move to the last slide there that I'll be doing. Thanks. And then there's the teacher pipeline programs. Probably the one that people most know about is uh, Teach for America, but uh, there's also lots of other ones and some are mentioned there. This similarly to the, the city or state residency model, you have some kind of intensive summer boot camp, and then you are the teacher of record when the school year begins. Um, I think the difference differences here is that um, sometimes you don't have as much choice about where your placement will be. Um, a lot of these uh, programs have rolling deadlines. So the later you apply, the more likely you are to not get necessarily your place, uh, your choice of a geographical region or necessarily your content area of choice that you would feel most um, comfortable teaching. You're also usually uh, placed in a school that has, um, you know, a challenge to, to uh, keep teachers at their school. And that may be because there are some issues with the adult learning culture at the school, or there may be some issues with really high administrative and teacher turnover. And as a result, that may impact how much you feel uh, supported in that it's really um, something that is is more variable, I think, to consider. And, um, you know, Teach for America, much like some of the No Excuses Charter Schools, has received a, a lot of backlash in terms of whether it's doing more harm than good. Um, it's also received some critique about uh, the treatment of its BIPOC uh, teachers recently. And so I think there's both sides to that. We're going to hear that from the panel tonight, but that's just something to consider um, in terms of the alternative certification pathways. And again, I just want to emphasize that, um, you know, if you're considering teaching as a short term option and not really looking at it in terms of longevity, you may think that this subsidized approach may be uh, better for you than um, having to invest in uh, a, a teacher residency model through a university based program. Thanks, Mira. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Oh, yeah. I would just also add to this that I think um, Teach for America and a lot of the charter school networks are the places that most aggressively recruit Yale students and students from other programs. So I think students often have the perception that this is the only pathway into teaching. So part of our goal in this presentation is to educate all of you and um, have you share with your peers that there are a lot of other ways of getting into teaching and uh, you just may need to go and find them. Um, I would add to what Melissa said that um, I, in the past couple of years as I've worked with Yale students, um, some people have had wonderful experiences with Teach for America, other people have had terrible experiences, and it's really impossible to predict which one of those it's going to be. And um, it always um, is just kind of heartbreaking when I have students who I know um, care so much about teaching and then they, they leave in the middle of a year because they're having a really traumatic experience at their school. Um, I've also seen a pattern um, recently this summer where a couple teachers have taken jobs um, at charter networks that said, oh, we've totally moved away from no excuses. We're all about social emotional learning, uh, restorative justice, anti-racist education. And then they go there and they find that um, they're in a much more uh, structured, um, test-based, um, like high level of accountability um, school environment than what they want to be in for kids. Um, so again, I would say um, really do your due, due, due diligence um, as you're looking at um, the, the kind of school climate that you want to be uh, joining. Another piece too is that um, some charter residency programs, um, in particular Success Academy, it doesn't give you a full teacher certification to work at the, a wide range of schools. Success Academy only certifies you to teach at um, uh, charters that have been authorized by SUNY, the SUNY school network. Um, so that means that that if you don't like being at success, you have a fairly limited range of uh, schools to go to. Um, I would also say too, that a lot of these programs are combined um, with the Relay Graduate School. Um, Melissa, would you just say a word about Relay? 
Yeah, so Relay, and there's there's one called Alden out on the West Coast. These are recent um, universities that have popped up that are um, using kind of the the use of the word university, university somewhat loosely. Uh, most of the people who, who teach in them are very competent uh, practice teachers, but they don't actually have... Um, you know, the research background of being an academic. And so you, you really get the focus on practice and you don't get that much support on the research and the theory uh, in terms of the pedagogy uh, behind teaching. There's a huge body of literature on not only like how to teach, but also um, how to prepare teachers to be teachers. And so um, that that can potentially be missing um, from those uh, programs like, like, like a relay. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so the last two um, things that I'm going to talk about, one is the option of going into uh, work in private schools. Um, and there are, uh, like with going into public schools, um, you can get hired either as a teacher or an assistant. Um, I think the pay for assistance in the private schools is even lower. It's something maybe like ten or twelve thousand dollars a year, um, but that's also because you're getting your full board and all of your um, so your housing and your food is all covered. Oftentimes, you're being a coach as well, um, and in these cases, you are doing full time teaching. Um, you're usually the teacher of record, um, unless you're an assistant teacher or a dorm resident. Um, you don't need to have a master's degree. Um, and in some cases, you do have the opportunity to earn a master's degree. I know Hopkins has a partnership with some private schools. Um, and typically, it's a one to two year commitment. Um, some benefits of private schools is, um, you know, you're not paid a ton of money, but you are getting room and board. You have small class sizes. There's a big focus on liberal arts curriculum. Um, some of the drawbacks of doing this as a way of entering teaching is that um, if you are living on campus, you have no separation from your students. Um, you're not necessarily getting a lot of training, although I think schools vary on that um, and, and the low pay of being an assistant teacher. Um, there are a number of placement organizations um, that you can sign up for that will then share your resume um, uh, with uh, a, a bunch of private schools. So educators ally Harney Sando and the Southern Teachers Agency are th three of the main ones. Um, and in the past, uh, teaching at private schools has paid less than public schools. Although I think um, I've heard from students that, that private schools are having teacher shortages as well. So actually the pay has increased um, and uh, you may be surprised um, by what the salary scale is like. Um, uh, Another organization to, to have in mind if you're interested in Catholic schools is um, basically the Catholic version of Teach for America, which is called Alliance for Catholic Education, um, where you get a teacher certification out of um, the University of Notre Dame um, and then work in a Catholic school around the country. And then finally, um, international education. Um, there's a lot of, a, a couple different ways that you can go into that. One is teaching at an international school. Um, uh, often where they want you to have prior teaching experience. Um, one is teaching English in a government school or some kind of after school tuition center or working for some kind of nonprofit or Peace Corps. Um, I think uh, for most of those, it's full time. You are the teacher of record. Um, and uh, off in, in the case of working in an international school, the expectation is that you have some kind of teacher training already. Um, and depending on where you are in the world, you may or may not need to know the local language. Um, and I have on this slide, um, and I'll share a link with it later. Um, I've, uh, you know, some of the programs that people know the most are programs like the Fulbright Teaching Fellowships and the Peace Corps, um, but there are a ton of other programs, um, some run by um, different uh, governments, um, some run by universities um, that, that uh, send students to do um, one or two year teaching programs all over the place. Um, so lots of different opportunities um, for thinking about teaching.